Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, my name is Hisa Kuriyama. I am the faculty director for the humanities at the Radcliffe Institute. And I'd certainly like to welcome you and thank you for coming uh, this afternoon. Um, I also want to congratulate you uh, for being here. Um, here you are on a beautiful October afternoon, October 22nd, 2018. Hopefully this will be an event that you'll remember for the rest of your lives. Um, you're very fortunate to be here, uh, which for I think what will be a memorable event. Um, as I'm, the fact that you're here, I think probably shows that you already know what uh, the great pleasures you have uh, in, in store. We're welcoming uh, first uh, Somaz Sharif, um, who I think probably most of you know something about, but let me just remind you, she is um, currently the Jones Lecturer in the Stanford Creative Writing Program, and really one of the, the rising stars in American poetry. Her first collection of poetry, Look, from which part of it, which she'll be reading um, from today, was a finalist for the National Book Award and was named a New York Times Notable Book of 2016, um, uh, Publisher's Weekly Best Book of 2016, the Washington Post Best Poetry Collection of 2016, and one of the New Yorker's books, uh, one of the New Yorker's books we loved in 2016. Um, it's won her numerous uh, literary um, fellowships, or fellowships, and I think you'll see uh, why this afternoon. Um, we're also privileged to have Evie Shockby, another very distinguished poet and a Radcliffe Fellow with us um, uh, to discuss uh, Somaz's poetry after her reading. Um, Evie herself is a is a um, prize-winning poet, um, and her collection, Semi-Automatic, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry and um, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in Poetry. Um, she's also a scholar of um, uh, African-American literature and is a professor at uh, Rutgers University. Um, we're happy to have Somas here, not only just because she's uh, um, generously uh, agreed to give this poetry reading, but also she's with us for this whole month working on the papers of uh, June Jordan, who is one of her professors at Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and um, as you may know, she, June Jordan was one of the, one of the great uh, poets of, um, of our times, and, and um, not least, uh, a very eloquent reader of poetry, and her, her papers at, at the Schlesinger include not only, um, as I learned just now, papers from her childhood, but also include an extensive uh, series of recordings of her readings and her interviews. Um, I mention this because I think this is one of the things that makes poetry readings so interesting and engaging, that our encounter with most poets is with the printed page. Um, but here we have the opportunity to really hear the music that's latent in the periods, the commas, uh, the mute line breaks, um, and in, in um, her work, look, um, so must utilizes not only these, these conventions, but also in, make, makes important use of things like italicization and capitalization. And I'm very curious to hear how that translates into the spoken word. Um, and I mentioned this not least because I think it's important to think about port readings especially, but also lectures in general as participatory events. Um, so she's reading for us, which is a wonderful, um, wonderful opportunity for us. But, but as listeners, I think it's important to think about listening as an activity. And I want to conclude by um, giving a short passage by Jules Michelet, French historian of the 19th century, 
uh, who in his inaugural lecture at the Collège de France was thanking uh, the people who were transcribing his lecture, but also expressing certain misgivings. And he says, this is uh, December 29th, 1842. He says, you may think that the only person is speaking, that only one person is speaking here, but you would be wrong. You are speaking too. I act and you react. I teach and you teach me. I can feel your objections, your approval. How? It's impossible to say. It is the mystery of great crowds, the flash of exchange, the interaction of minds. Teaching is not an exhibition. It is the fertile mutual communication between a speaker and an audience as they explore together. So with that, I'd like you to all welcome enthusiastically our speaker, Soma al-Sharif. Thank you, everyone. Hello. I um, am just so overjoyed to be here, and I thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I'm going to start by reading some poems from my first collection, which is called Look, and then maybe I'll close with a couple newer poems at the end. Um, but Look is a, is a book that deals in part with the US Department of Defense's Dictionary of Military and Associated Terms. The US Department of Defense has its own internal dictionary that aims to supplement standard English dictionaries, amending the definitions that we might find there to fit their, their context. So for example, the word look itself has been redefined by the Department of Defense to mean in mine warfare, a period during which a mine circuit is receptive of an influence. And the influence is uh, obviously the, the person that is stepping on, on the mine. So the definition gives us a, a kind of example of the, the twisted syntax and, and the euphemism and everything that really goes into creating a language that will allow for uh, violence. And, I have always been obsessed with uh, state-sponsored language and how um, a violence against bodies is premeditated in a violence against language, how that intersects with the role of the poet um, as a caretaker of language, if, if nothing else, um, and, and what it might mean to kind of make, make the language of the state reckon with the language of the lyric and the language of the self. Um, and so that's where it starts with this, with this book. Um, maybe to give us a sense of the, this, this DOD language, I'll actually read a poem that's called Perception Management. It's an abridged list of operation names, actual operation names taken from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Perception Management. Antica Babylonia, Baghdad, Bastille, Abilene, Suicide Kings, Gun Barrel City, God Help Us, Army Santa, Cave Dwellers, Rock Bottom, Plymouth Rock, Rat Trap, Cow Pens, Baghdad is Beautiful, Backbreaker, Block Party, Swashbuckle, Swarmers, Punisher, Beastmaster, Flea Flicker, Firecracker, Lightning Hammer, Iraqi Home Protector, Tombstone Pile Driver, Bone Breaker, Iron Reaper, Bell Huria, Enjoy Freedom, Spring Break, Rocket Man, Gladiator, Outlaw Destroyer, Dirty Harry, Gold Digger, Unforgiven, Raging Bull, Thundercat, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. Look, it matters what you call a thing. Exquisite, a lover called me exquisite. Whereas, well, if I were from your culture living in this country, said the man outside the 2004 Republican National Convention, I would put up with that for this country. 
Whereas I felt the need to clarify, you would put up with torture, you mean, and he proclaimed, yes. Whereas what is your life? Whereas years after they look down from their jets and declare my mother's Abaddon block probably destroyed, we walked by the villas, the faces of buildings torn off into dioramas, and recorded it on a handheld camcorder. Whereas it could take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger pulled in Las Vegas and the Hellfire missile landing in mazar sharif after which they will ask, did we hit a child? No, a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas the federal judge at the sentencing hearing said, I want to make sure I pronounce the defendant's name correctly. Whereas this lover would pronounce my name and call me exquisite and lay the floor lamp across the floor, softening even the light. Whereas the lover made my heat rise, rise so that if heat sensors were trained on me, they could read my thermal shadow through the roof and through the wardrobe. Whereas, it's not like seeing a dead body walking to the grocery store here. It's not like that. It's a rock, you know, it's a rock. It's kind of like acceptable to see that there and not. It was kind of like seeing a dead dog or a dead cat lying. Whereas I thought if he would look at my exquisite face or my father's, he would reconsider. Whereas, you mean I should be disappeared because of my family name? And he answered, yes, that's exactly what I mean, adding that his wife helped draft the Patriot Act. Whereas the federal judge wanted to be sure he was pronouncing the defendant's name correctly and said he had read all the exhibits, which included the letter I wrote to cast the defendant in a loving light. Whereas today we celebrate things like his transfer to a detention center closer to home. Whereas his son has moved across the country. Whereas I made nothing happen. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a thermal shadow. It appears so little and then vanishes from the screen. Whereas I cannot control my own heat, and it can take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger, the Hellfire missile, and a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas a dog, they will say, now, therefore, let it matter what we call a thing. Let it be the exquisite face for at least 16 seconds. Let me look at you. Let me look at you in a light that takes years to get here. Deception story. Friends describe my disposition as stoic. Like a dead fish, an ex said. Distance is a funny drug and used to make me a distressed person, one who cried in bedrooms and airports. Once I bawled so hard at the border, even the man with the stamps and holster said, don't cry, you'll be home soon. My distribution over the globe debated and set to quota. A nation can only handle so many of me. Ditching class, I break into my friend's dad's mansion and swim in the Beverly Hills pool in a borrowed t-shirt, a brief diversion. My body breaking the chlorinated surface makes it momentarily my house, my division of driveway gate and alarm codes, my dress rehearsed doctrine of pool boys and ping pong and water delivered on the backs of sequined sparklets trucks. Over here, Dolly, an agent will call out, then pat the hair at your hot black dome. After explaining what she will touch, backs of the hands of the breasts and buttocks, the hand goes inside my waistband and my heart goes dormant, a dead fish, the last female assist I decided to hit on. My life in the American dream is a downgrade, a mere draft of home. Correction, it satisfies as drag. It is snarling what I carve of it alone. I have an uncle, or had uh, an uncle who was a draftee um, in the Iran-Iraq war and was killed and I never met him. And uh, I learned that when he was killed, he had a slim uh, photo album on his body and I also learned that he had sent letters from the front lines home to his family and so I used those materials and basically whatever I could kind of get my hands on, whatever Wikipedia entry or, or like little historical document that I could find to try to piece together or understand this, this life and I wrote a long elegy out of this. Um, it's called Personal Effects and I'll just read a few sections of that. 
It opens with an epigraph uh, by Susan Sontag. Um, like guns and cars, cameras are fantasy machines whose use is addictive. I place a photograph of my uncle on my computer desktop, which means I learn to ignore it. He stands by a tank, helmet tilting to his right, boot laces tightened as if stitching together a wound. Alive, the hand brings up a cigarette we won't see him taste. Last night, I smoked one on the steps outside my barn apartment. I promise I broke myself. He promised himself he wouldn't and did. I smell my fingers and I'm smelling his. Hands of smoke and gunpowder. Hands that promised they wouldn't but did. You were not ready, but they issued the shovel and the rifle and you dug. But to watch you sitting there between the sandbags, but to watch the sand spilling out the bullet holes, but what did they expect? But what did they really think a sheet of metal could prevent? But I sat rolling little ears of pasta off my thumb like helmets, but it was not a table of fallen men, but my hand registered fatigue, but the men in fatigues were tired of sleeping in shifts, but you snuck into town and dialed home until you wrote your fingers were tired, but the code for Shiraz was down, but all of Shiraz was down, but the sheet lightning above the ferris wheel of rusted bolts, but I'm sure they are all right, you wrote. Well, to reassure yourself, but the wind like an old mouth shaking the unnamed evergreen outside my window, but what I mean is I'd like very much to talk a bit. Hello. Daily, I sit with the language they've made of our language to neutralize the capability of low dollar value items like you. You are what is referred to as a casualty. Unclear whether from a catalytic or frontal attack. Unclear the final time you were addressed, thou beloved, it was for us a catastrophic event. Just destroyed died of wounds received in action. Yes, there was early warning. You said you were especially scared of mortar rounds. In execution planning, they weighed the losses, the sustainability, and budgeted for X number of you. They budgeted for the phone call to your mother and weighed that against the amount saved in rations and your taste for cigarettes and the tea you poured your boys and the tea you would have poured me approaching, hello, the change you collected in jars, jumping a bit as the family learns to slam the home's various doors. What I see are your hands peeling apples, the skin curling to the floor in one long unravel, a spit up film reel loosened from its canister. And I'm not even sure they are apples, quince, pear, some desert potato with a stem. From the number of peels, I assume you're feeding the other men in your tent. Your head is down. Maybe the cameraman asked you to look at him and you couldn't stomach it. Maybe around you today they fell until you didn't understand how you hadn't been hit. I decide you are happy for the knife in your hands, the white dust on your bare feet. I am happy to see your bare feet in this photo. They are the only things that made me cry. It's that they existed and that they, appalling, look so dead already. I think it's fair to say you want something to do with your hands, whether or not the photographer placed the apples in front of you, whether or not they are apples, whether or not earlier that day you saw a friend's lungs peeking out the back of his throat. I cannot name the weapons leaning on the wall behind you, Kalishnikovs, howitzers, as you write a letter. I wrote, I burn my finger on the broiler and smell trenches, my uncle pissing himself. How can she write that? She doesn't know a friend, a daughter of a Vietnam vet told another friend, another daughter of a Vietnam vet. I write him daily and so I learn to ignore him and so I begin to list pocket contents as if filing an autopsy report and I place in his hands a metal tongue of a fly and I place in his hands a metal tongue of a tank control board 
and I place in his hands a big lighter and loose leaf paper, and I place in his hands a trigger, a shutter, and still not even a bar of his laughter, and by April the script in his letters grew tighter, barbed, men in a shoulder with trench. And when I sounded out mean to mean landmine, a hole appeared in his letter and I couldn't look at it. And I drove into pothole after pothole, and I drove past a hundred balloons held down in a net, and gone even the netting over his helmet. And alive, we bring up his hands to hold together his neck. And I place in his hands his head. And I place in his hands my hands. And I place in his eyes a look we share in the rear view. And I place between us a bar of laughter. And I place between us the looking and the telling they want dead. So I was asked to write a, a nature poem, and I tried to write one. Um, and it's called Inspiration Point Berkeley, which uh, is a place in, at Tilden Regional Park in, in Berkeley, California, um, and uh, has this great peace grove. Anyway, it, it did not stay a nature poem for very long. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking about as, as I was writing this poem is, is like, you know, what, what might, if, if, uh, if this, uh, if settler colonialism was a certain kind of sentence, what might it be? And then it became very clear to me immediately that it would be a run-on sentence that is grabbing as much as possible, uh, comma by comma. And um, of course, or maybe not of course, but I am interested in the ways that, you know, uh, quote unquote land preservation and, and the construction of parks and the maintenance of parks some, is lined up and lines up with land grabs and a settler colonial project that um, aims to create a land that is uh, seen as free of, of people. So inspiration point Berkeley. Consider Kissinger. The honorary globe trotter of Harlem who spins on fingertip the world as balloon. The buffoon erected and beplacked here by the Rotary Club as evergreen. And in this peace grove planted alongside Waldheim and Nixon, Bush, Herbert Walker, and Mother Teresa, one Pope, one Dalai Lama, one Dr. King. Kissinger, who was the one the bunnies in Hughes Mansion voted MILF and is named here in our great tradition of naming as on the Anza expedition, the conquistadors dropped armored mission after armored mission after saints, Luis Obispo, Francisco, etc. Up this western coast, my lover and myself now, by cleared path regard, hardly touching each other or the invasive grasses, the conquistadors also brought, perhaps by boot sole, perhaps by taste, as we like to do, to tote and plant and raise a home we can recognize, even when we want anew. We two invaders who love to recognize each other by shoulder stoop, by tone behind closed door, or down beyond the trail bend. And so the grasses are Mediterranean, as were the Spanish in what was before their former windows, as is Vista Point, which is where we are asked to stand, to see before us land unnamed, and imagine ourselves, we twin atoms, as the didactics at the trailhead suggest, witnessing the native flora that, before eucalyptus and other pacification flourished here. Didactics that provide a painted rendition of the lands, wild flowered and alive, before the Spanish came and we came behind them and there is not a one in the painting, not a bowl or blanket, not a toe or term of endearment, not a mother, not a swimmer in the painted pre-Spanish San Pablo Creek, though there are realistically rendered salmon. There is nothing that has nothing to do with this. Hmm. The first two lines of this poem are lifted from a translation of uh, Ovid's Ibis poem, which is a cursed poem that he wrote in exile. Um, and uh, 
is written kind of in, in the middle of these, these poems that are really pathetic and, and heartbreaking, pleas to be allowed back home. Um, but then there's this elaborate kind of curse that, that comes in. And so I lift the lines. Desired appreciation. Until now, now that I've reached my 30s, all my muse's poetry has been harmless, American and diplomatic. A learned helplessness is what psychologists call it, my docile desired state. I've been largely well-behaved and gracious. I've learned the doctors learned of learned helplessness by shocking dogs. Eventually, we things give up. Am I grateful to be here? Someone eventually asks if I love this country. In between the helplessness, the agents, the nation must administer a bit of hope, must meet basic dietary needs, ensure by tube, by nose, by throat, by other orifice, must fist bump a janitor, must muss up some kid's hair and let them loose around the Oval Office. Click, click could be cameras or the teeth of handcuffs closing to fix the arms overhead. There must be a doctor on hand to ensure the shoulders do not dislocate, and there must be Prince's Raspberry Beret. Click, click could be Morse code tapped out against a coffin wall to the neighboring coffin. Outside my window, the snow lights cobalt for a bit at dusk, and I'm surprised every second of it. I'd never seen the country like this. Somehow I can't say yes. This is a beautiful country. I have not cast my eyes over it before that is in this direction is how John Brown put it when he looked out from the scaffold. I feel like I must muzzle myself, I told my psychiatrist. So you feel dangerous, she said. Yes. So you feel like a threat? Yes. Why was I so surprised to hear it? That, that poem uh, led me down a rabbit hole of self-help texts and, and the self-improvement industry, and, uh, and specifically all the ways that we are asked to change or alter the language that we use to describe the world around us in order to make ourselves uh, better subjects and in order to be able to tolerate what is, what is surrounding us, right? So it's kind of, I see it as a, a, an inverse of look. Um, I'm looking basically at how power is insisting or insists upon our own personal inner language and the language that we use to speak to one another and the tones that we present ourselves with um, to be altered in order to live, right? Uh, so this poem called Social Skills Training begins with two, uh, statement, two lines that are, is reading those studies that are, are kind of like, they're negotiation tactics. If you want to get this thing done, word it this way, not this way. Um, and so they're lifted from two, two such studies, and, and you'll see. Social skills training. Studies suggest, how may I help you, officer, is the single most disarming thing to say and not what's the problem. Studies suggest it's best the help reply, my pleasure, and not, no problem. Studies suggest it's best not to mention problem in front of power, even to say there is none. Gloria Steinem says, women lose power as they age, and yet the loudest voice in my head is my mother. Studies show the mother we have in mind isn't the mother that exists. Mine says, what the fuck are you crying for? Studies show the baby monkey will pick the fake monkey with fake fur over the furless wire monkey with milk without contest. Studies show to negate a thing is to think it anyway. I'm not sad. I'm not sad. Studies recommend regular expressions of gratitude and internal check-ins. Studies define assertiveness as self-respect cut with the deference. Enough, the wire mother says. History is a kind of study. History says we forgave the executioner. Before we mopped the blood, we asked, Lord, judge, have I executed well? Studies suggest, yes. What the fuck are you crying for, officer? The wire mother teaches me to say. While studies suggest, Solmaz, have you thanked your executioner today?
Dear Aleph, like Ovid, I'll have no last words. This is what it means to die among barbarians. Bar, bar, bar was how the Greeks heard our speech, sheep, beasts, and so we became barbarians. We make them reveal the brutes they are, Aleph, by the things we make them name. David, they tell me, is the one one should aspire to. But ever since I first heard them say Philistine, I've known I am Goliath if I am anything. America. I had to. I learned it. It was if. If was nice. I said, sure, one more thing, one more thing. Eat, it said. It felt good. I was dead. I learned it. I had to. I'll read one last poem to close, and then we'll move on into a conversation, I hope. Uh, this poem is called The Master's House. To wave from the porch, to let go of the grudge, to disrobe, to recall Ethel Rosenberg's green polka dotted dress, to call your father and say, I'd forgotten how nice everyone in these red states can be, to hear him say, yes, as long as you don't move in next door, to recall every drawn curtain in the apartments you have lived, to find yourself at 33 at a vast expanse with nary a papyrus of guidance, with nary a voice, a muse, a model, to finally admit out loud then, I want to go home, to have a dinner party of intellectuals with a bell, long arm, lightly tongued at each setting, to sport your done gown, to revel in face serums, to be a well-calibrated burn victim, to fight the signs of aging, to assure financial health, to be lavender sachets and cedar lining and all the ways the rich might hide their rot, to eye the master's bone china, to pour diuretic in his coffee and think this erosive to the state, to disrobe when the agent asks you to, to find a spot on any wall to stare into, to develop the ability to leave an entire nation thusly just by staring at a spot on the wall as the lead vested agent names article by article what to remove, to do this in order to do the other thing, the wild thing, to say this is my filmdom, the master's house, and I gaze upon it and it is good, to discuss desalinization plants, to date briefly a banker, a lapsed Marxist, and hear him on the phone speaking in billions of dollars, its residue over the clear bulbs of his eyes as he turns to look upon your nudity, to fantasize publishing a poem in the New Yorker eviscerating his little need, to set a bell at each intellectual's table setting, ringing idea after idea and be a simple-footed help rushing to say yes, to disrobe when the agent asks you to, to find a spot on any wall to stare into, to develop the ability to leave an entire nation thusly just by staring at a spot on the wall, to say this is my filmdom, to recall the settler who from behind his mobile phone said, I'm filming you for God, to recall this sad God, God of the mobile phone camera, God of the small black globe and pixelated eye above the blackjack table at Harris and the metal tooth pit at Calendia checkpoint the same. To recall the Texan that held the shotgun to your father's chest, sending him falling backward, pleading, and the words come to him in Farsi. To be jealous of this, his most desperate language. To lament the fact of your lamentations in English, English being your first defeat. To finally admit out loud then, I want to go home. To know, for example, in Farsi, the present perfect is called the relational past and is used at times to describe a historic event whose effect is still relevant today, transcending the past. To say, for example, Shah Dictator Bude Ast translates to the Shah was a dictator, but more literally, the Shah is was a dictator. To have a tense of is was, the residue of it over the clear bulb of your eyes to walk cemetery after cemetery in these states and nary a gravestone reading Solmaz, 
to know no nation will be home until one does. To do this in order to do the other thing, the wild thing, though you've forgotten what it was. Thank you. Thank you, just thank you. Oh, I can't believe this is the first time I've heard you read. Oh my gosh. In you know, yeah. live, um, so to speak. Yeah. So um, I am I'm deeply honored and delighted to be here to talk with you about your work. Um, how many have read some of Look Beyond What We Heard Today? Yes, all right, this is, this is the audience we need. Um, and I hope the rest of you will join us. Um, so I actually want to start with one of the lines from your book that I consider um, kind of the most load-bearing line, um, or one of the most load-bearing lines. It's in the title poem, Look. Um, comes near the end, you read it today. Um, now, therefore, let it matter what we call a thing, right? Um, the project of this book, in so many ways, is to um, have the reader confront that proposition about the use and meaning of language um, and to, to really um, think about what, what it means to use language and, and why there's such an urgency around that project for you, right? Could you talk a little bit about what it means to be a poet writing in English mm -hmm. in the context of, of this book? Yeah, uh, oof, okay. Um, I wanna say something about that line that you pointed out first, if that's okay. The, that first poem, Look, I wrote, I mean, I worked on this book for about eight years, and I wrote that poem late in the game. So I got to basically go back and say, what's the opening poem of the book? What is, and I thought, you know, what is the argument that I want to make, actually? You know, what is it that I want to enact? Um, and then I also thought, you know, this is not just the opening poem to this, to a book, but it's the opening poem to the first book of, hopefully, you know, a life of, of books, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I challenged myself with the question of what is a statement that you can make that you feel like your entire writing life will be held in that statement, you know, and what is it that you, um, what, is, what is the role of the poet as you see it or understand it? And, uh, and it simply was that, you know, it matters what you call a thing and it should matter and, and the, my role as a poet, in part, is to remain vigilant over that, that kind of mattering um, and the kind of care and attention that is behind uh, language and the words that we use to describe each other or not, and, and to point to its absence. My relationship to English in particular is a, is a difficult one, you know. English is, in many ways, a language of my own, you know, kind of dispossession and, and exile. Um, I feel pretty uh, inadequate in English, or I feel like I am not saying, I'm, yeah. And, but I think that that sense of lack or, or you know, this idea that I, I can't quite say what I need to say and I don't know enough words in this language to, to name my life mm -hmm. um, is something that led me to poetry because when one has only a few words to describe one's whole life, then one has to become very creative in how you place those words, right? Absolutely. To communicate the, the totality of your, of your thought and your mind and your heart. Um, so, so that's also a part of it, yeah. And English, do you consider it your first language? I consider it my second language, though it's, you know, I, I spent the first, two years of my life learning Farsi at home, basically. And, um, but that was in the US. 
So English was always around and, and in my ear and everything, but um, it, it was the language that I then had to learn, I think, after Farsi, yeah. Right, right, it, and so that magnifies a problem that um, writers like Intozaki Shange and Norbesi Philip have um, also talked about, which is, you know, and you referred to this, the, this language being a language in which you are, did you say dehumanized? I could, one could say that, yeah. One could yeah, say that, yeah. um, in which some of us have been colonized mm -hmm. or enslaved, and, and that you're, as a writer, you have to come to the page and think about how to use words that either didn't have you in mind or did have you in mind, right? right? <laughs> in different ways. Right, but as a, what, what did he say today? What kind of Middle Easterner am I today? Anybody? Trump? Oh. Unknown, thank you, yes. There are known knowns and known unknowns and now they're unknown Middle Easterners, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the, the depths to which language can um, descend. Um, so I'm also thinking a lot about um, these, the, the idea of defining terms, right, and redefining them and the, the occlusion of meaning. Um, but then also what it means to write in, um, let me say it like this, if you, if you come to writing with a certain kind of skepticism or wariness mm -hmm. about the, the kind of cynical way that the language can be used, um, how do you find your way to what might be possible in language? What are, what are the possibilities of language for you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, I think the, possi the possibilities of language are the possibilities of power itself, you know, and and in that way, huge and endless and and terrifying, but also terrific, perhaps, you know, if it is kept alive and um, if it is kept in constant rotation, yeah. um, and if it is as messy and as collectively kind of described and and realized as possible. And I think that that's part of my role is to, to keep language agitated in that, in that way if I can. Um, and, and I think that our, I live for the moment where in a thing is named and there's a spark of recognition, but that naming has not yet become calcified, you know, or a thing that then is you know, pinning something down and becomes something to a, a definition or a meaning to police in any kind of way. Um, and poetry feels to me to be one medium where that is the, um, it's, a, it's a requirement of poetry almost, right, to, to keep language that agitated and alive. And so um, politically, I think that that is really important yes. also, and the possibilities are endless in that way, yeah. I, I love that word, agitation, yeah. um, or the political meanings it brings, as well as the, the sense of, you know, that's what a washing machine does, right. is agitate. Mm -hmm. so you're, you're cleaning it somehow mm -hmm. <laughs> of some of that baggage. I mean, so maybe, I mean, there's so many places to go when, once you raise the idea of the political, which your poetry does from the beginning. Um, we could talk about June Jordan as an influence, mm -hmm. is, is to what extent she might be responsible for or a pathway to showing you what you could do. With poetry. Every extent, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put that on the table. Um, and, and also just what, I mean, you, you gestured to how long you were working on this book, which mm -hmm. came out in 2016. You started, I think, in 2011, mm -hmm. some of these early. 2007, 2008, yeah. Oh, right, right. Okay, yeah. so it, it seems to me, as someone who sees you as a kindred spirit in poetic terms, um, that what it meant to write political poetry in 2007 or even 2011 is a different thing than what it means mm -hmm. today and the way that word might circulate. So I, I would like to just you know, throw, throw that at you. What, what has, um, do you embrace the term political poet? Mm -hmm. What had, did it mean to you then? What does it mean to you now? Has it changed? Mm -hmm. I think, uh... 
I mean, put simply, the role of the political poet is to speak truth to power, you know? And so that, that is something I'm invested in. Um, and, and a term that I use to describe myself and my process for a long time. Um, and I have been advised on numerous occasions by various people to not use, use the term, um, in part because it is seen as uh, potentially pigeonholing and limiting, um, but I, I'm, I'm not worried about that, honestly. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't phase me in any really way. Um, there, I, I have noticed, I think, a shift in the reception of, uh, or, or even just the use of that term political poetry in the US, particularly in this post-2016 you know, Trump era, where for many people, or some people, I'm not sure the number, um, you know, this was a moment of kind of crisis, right? So how did we end up here? Um, while for some of us or many of us, it was a continuation of what we had already seen to be, to, to be true in many ways. Um, and in that crisis, I think m many uh, American writers started to ask, you know, where are our political poets? Mm -hmm. um, and well, we've been here the whole time, that, and, and we have been writing. And, you know, and June, June Jordan is one of those people that, that is a political poet and, and is sorely undertaught, you know, and, um, and has modeled so many um, uh, ethical and, and political positions that really, you know, I think it would behoove us all to, to spend time with her work at this point, and at any point, really. Her influence on me has been tremendous. I actually never got a chance to work with her. Her name was on the schedule of classes when I signed up for Poetry for the People, and when I showed up to the first class, she was on medical leave. Ah, uh, yes. And, uh, and it was... And this interesting thing happened where, so Poetry for the People would, would teach, uh, that semester they were teaching poems in African, African American traditions, um, Asian, Asian American traditions, I can't remember the other, the third group, but um, this fascinating thing was happening where it was like, she'll be here next week to do a guest lecture on this thing, because that thing is clearly the thing that she should be giving a guest lecture on, you know? Um, and every week, every topic in this global kind of body of literature seemed to be the, the precise lecture that she should be giving, you know? Yeah. And I thought, wow, like the scope of that, of that mind and that sensibility. Um, but week by week, you know, she, she was unable to come and she, she died that summer. But I'm spending time right now in her papers and there's notes on an early class that she gave on Brecht and there's a quote of his that she's written that I'm going to, I don't know where, so if somebody knows where this quote is from, please do let me know because it's just in the, in the scrap in there. But um, where Brecht says, evil has a physical address. And I think uh, of June's insistence on specificity, hmm. on naming FBI, CIA, Lumumba, and Kruma, using actual names to locate not just evil, but celebration. And, and, you know, and that insistence on specificity is really something that's, that's guided me and something that I'm invested in. And I also think that uh, perhaps something that has been repressed in American letters writ large as a, as a kind of um, lesser than or a writing that refuses to transcend the, the specific, right, into this universal kind of realm. Um, and so, you know, part of my answer to those, those critics who might be asking, where are our political poets, you know, it's what, uh, what in poetry have you valued thus far? And how have your values repressed political possibility in American poetry if you're not, if you're not seeing it? Right. What what do what do we reward, mm -hmm. and what do we disseminate and perpetuate? I mean, June Jordan um, is having something of a renaissance right now, for reasons including the fact that her papers have been opened up here at Radcliffe, and I have so many friends who've come and and been uh, with you, sort of uh, virtually with mm -hmm. you in the stacks uh, or in the archives, and so. 
Uh, it's an exciting moment. She seemed to be prescient about everything, yeah. and as you said, has have something to say, meaningful and powerful about so many of the things right. that we're confronting. Um, there, okay, I'm going to try to to shift gears, probably roughly, because there's a whole other aspect of your work that I want to, um, I guess, bring to the fore. Um, and maybe one of the ways to do that is um, you talked about naming and specificity. And it made me think about how much her poetry uses lists. Mm -hmm. You also use lists. And you, you are virtuoso in a number of different forms, um, like lists, the epistolary poem. Um, you use syllabics. You, of course, um, do this marvelous tour of the definition poem, right? I mean, you. Um, you seem to reach for a, a number of different um, tools to, to bring out the, the, the things that concern you. Could you talk a little bit about um, the form of your poetry? Um, but also, because it's connected to the ideas that we were talking about in terms of the political and what's rewarded. Sonia Sanchez has said that she used form, specifically Rhyme Royal, to write about the death of her brother from AIDS. She used form as a way of managing her grief mm -hmm. to keep something poetic happening as opposed to just the meltdown on the page. Could you talk about your use of form generally, but also in relation to um, what I can only imagine is the intense grief un, under which you were writing or about which you were writing mm -hmm. in Look. Mm -hmm. um, I, my relationship to form is restless and nomadic and constantly shifting. I rarely write in inherited forms, um, but instead come up with uh, formal restrictions to, to place on my poems as the poems have decided them for me. And when I think of form, I think of form as power enacted. And I think that form can be one place where we can diagnose the ways that power might be interrupting speech or preventing speech from reaching where it needs to reach, um, breaking the music. I, I'm drawn to syllabics that are non-accentual because they are supposedly such an unnatural thing that you could do to English language. They are basically order for the sake of order, just random numbers that have decided what a line will be or not be and where it ends and where it doesn't. And, and I find that my own relationship to English is closer to, to that than, it, than to a like, free verse kind of uh, position. Mm -hmm. um, and a lyric position. Or a lyric position, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so I, I don't know, I don't know that it enabled, uh, I'm trying to figure out my like, form's relationship to grief and to that kind of holding. I do know that if I feel like I am doing something in order to make the thing that I'm doing somehow more tolerable for me, my own impulse is then to stop doing it. So if I had been doing it, I was doing it without knowing, if that makes sense. That's yeah. interesting. So it's the opposite for you. You want something raw. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's mm -hmm. um, a very vulnerable position to place yourself. Um, and do you, do you find that, um, how do you think about that idea of rawness in relation to creation? Is poetry about beauty for you? Um, or what would beauty, how would you define beauty mm -hmm. um, in the context of that kind of creative act? I, I don't define beauty. I don't think much of beauty. <laughs> I don't think much about it. I don't mm -hmm. think much of it. I don't think much of beauty. I, I don't think. Um, <laughs> it's not something that drives, maybe it is beauty. I think the thing I'm, you know, I think I'm more after truth, and you know, maybe it's beauty. But um, <laughs> what I'm after is like is an intensity of of regard and um, attention and experience, and 
and naming in a way that, that heightens our awareness of our own precarity and our own mortality. Um, and perhaps sometimes that finds, the, finds beauty, you know, but not always. And that's not really the, the kind of anchoring or guiding star for me in that, in that way, actually. This is not emotion recalled in tranquility. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I want to keep an eye on the time. We want to mm -hmm. have some, some um, time for questions from the audience. Uh, but uh, I will take this opportunity to, to maybe ask you one or two more. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, the way you use form in your poetry, not in relation to inherited form, but the, the look of your poems on the page. I was really struck by um, he says opening comments about um, you know taking notice of the way you use those small caps to signal the, these terms that are come that you're drawing from the the definition, the the, the U.S. Department of Defense's definitions um, dictionary, mm -hmm. um, but we don't hear them, right? So there are other poems in which you use blank space to represent um, censorship um, or to represent untranslatability, um, perhaps other things. I mean, how? I don't think you read any of those particular moments. Are they readable? How, what, is the, what is the meaning of silence? in your poetry in relation to language and, mm -hmm. and how do you think about that visual mm -hmm. form? Um, so I have a number of, of poems in the book that are imagined letters to a Guantanamo detainee and it's, uh, it's called Reaching Guantanamo and it's, um, I wrote it after I was reading a New York Times article about the mental health status of, of detainees, and, and this was in 2008, and there was a line in passing that said, you know, mail that reaches Guantanamo detainees is heavily redacted by the Joint Task Force, and it kind of moved on from there. Um, so I wrote a series of imagined letters with redactions, and the redactions are just noted by white space, not as opposed to a black bar. Um, there's something about the white space that also feels more terrifying to me because you can't quite tell where it ends. Like at the end of the line, you don't know if the white space is continuing. Um, and, and you don't, you, you know, it's not as defined and contained. And for me in that poem, it, or in those poems, it was important to uh, really name and honor the, the spiritual violence that's carried out by, this, by these acts of, of censorship. Um, and how they are designed to, in fact, you know, make a, make a prisoner then question their own reality and, and what is before them on the letter in, 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 in front of them. I, um, when I read those poems, I read, I, I, you know, my voice kind of just drops out and I leave silence, silence there. Um, and I do think it's possible to read. In, in terms of the DOD terms that I use, where I use small caps, um, I wanted there to be multiple experiences of the work. So there's one experience that one has when I read the poems out loud, and then one can then go and look at them on the page, and there will be another veil that's kind of dropped over it, and it's a veil that's pointing to the, the violence that's just shimmering underneath you know, the language that we're using this whole time. Um, and I liked the idea of having a doubled experience of, of reading the poems and, and having them be um, somewhat deceptively one thing in a reading and then another thing in the, in the book. And, and also um, the experience of, of reading in the book and, and, the line, and the way that the line breaks are happening is very different than the way I read the poems out loud. And so um, one can kind of see visually um, these moments of uh, more like violent interdiction in the, in the poems themselves, which was important to me for this book. It's really effective. Um, there's so many moments in the book that leave me, leave me silent or, or speechless. I, I think one of the poems that probably grips me the most, uh, this is uh, back to one of the, the definitional mm. poems, um, theater. Mm. Um, there's something about, you know, the, the speaker of this poem narrates his own death, basically. And, of course, you could think about Randall Jarrell, um, but you 
remake that idea in, in such a powerful way. The, the meaning of the word theater in terms of theater of war and the meaning of theater in terms of acting and it all comes together so, so amazingly. I just had to have a moment to gush. Nice. Um, <laughs> so uh, before we open it up for questions, I'm just gonna ask you an open-ended, perhaps difficult question. Okay. And that is, what was the most difficult thing for you in writing Look? Most difficult and most challenging? I mean, I think the most difficult thing remains the reality of the violence that Look is talking about and looking at. And, um, and there's a quote in here from a Frank Bedart poem written in the voice of Nijinsky, uh, the ballet dancer that famously attempted to choreograph World War I to you know, upset his, his audience um, and, and lost his, his mind. Um, and I think of that, that, that movement and, that, and that, that dance that nobody you know, doesn't actually exist anymore, but um, that I know of, as, a, as the muse behind my own, my own process and position in, in writing this book, um, which makes it uh, and made it um, necessarily overwhelming. Um, and so uh, difficult, but as it must be. Yes. I wouldn't trust it if, there were, if it weren't. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, we could talk about ethics and, and the ethics of putting the reader somewhere where you haven't been, mm -hmm. and that's not, um, not the gesture that you're making. So thank you thank so you, much Andrew. for this thank work. You. Um, <laughs> Solmaz is open to your questions. And there's a mic here in the aisle if you would like to go into some of the territory I haven't gone into. Please come forth. Hi. Hi. Um, you both mentioned the un problems of untranslatability and your issues with working in English uh, with like the cultural background and talking about issues that relate to your identity. Um, how do you negotiate not putting in too many words that aren't English and like, or when you do use those words, what is the intention? Um, like I find this to be a problem when I'm trying to write, because my lang first language is Turkish, and to put it in a lot of words from a home language often confuses and alienates the reader, and that could be the intention, but sometimes it might be too much, so how do you negotiate that balance? Mm -hmm. Um, I, okay, I'll start with a pet peeve that I have, which, and it's, it's actually an inside joke in my family. There's a, there's a movie called House of Sand and Fog um, about an Iranian family, and uh, the way it works is, you know, the, the patriarch, I can't remember his name, but he'll say, um, like, he'll go, Pesaram, my boy. Pesaram in Farsi means my boy. So to our ears, we're hearing my boy, my boy, right? And, and so we get the Farsi word, but then so we, we are not alienating this English speaking audience. We get the immediate and like one-to-one -one translation of that word, fault, you know. I, that I absolutely, um, I, I refuse to do in, in my work because uh, that was, that's basically then assuming that no Farsi speaker will ever hear the poem and is absolutely not the audience. That said, I acknowledge and I am writing in English, right? So m my target audience will be English speaking in some way. And I think of those moments of untranslated, like what I'll do is I'll take a song, a lyric, and then one line will be in Farsi and then the next line of the song might be in English. And so it kind of carries, but, but it's not um, necessarily a translation of what, of what preceded. And I think that's, that's closer also to how I talk, you know? Like I'll slide into Farsi and I'll say something and then I'll pick it up again in English and continue like that. And so uh, that helps really keep the poem as close to my own speech and, and syntax of thought, you know, as, as possible. I think alienation is fine, ultimately. I mean, I think like, why not? <laughs> 
you know, and, and, and so many, and I also like the idea of, uh, to go back to agi agitating a reader a little bit, or irritating a reader a little bit, and, you know, and, and perhaps making gestures of closure in some places, you know, and, and carving out spaces of uh, cultural or linguistic privacy in a, in a poem, I think, is incredibly moving and, and um, full of potential. You know, it's not one that I have, I have mined extensively, but, but I admire it, yeah. Hi. Hi. Evie, it's great to see you and see both of you. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what this means to be kindred spirits for each other. Well. <laughs> I said that, so I, it's not fair to ask so much. <laughs> um, for me, it just means I recognize in her a, a similar desire to find truth, speak mm -hmm. about it, name it. Um, and to, to do so in a way that, that communicates to readers mm -hmm. and, and might move us beyond, we talked about this, beyond um, feeling mm -hmm. towards action. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely, and I think, you know, I wanna go back to something that you'd said, which was that the, the point of, of language and, and, and then writing, you know, ultimately is, is one of connection, you know, and to, after what I just said about irritating a reader, right? But, but, to, <laughs> but, but to have the ultimate goal be one of that kind of connection, right? But you're deciding your, your, where you're connecting, exactly. you know, and to whom you're speaking and, and what you're doing with your language and what you refuse to do with your own, with your own language as well. I find that that is an, an area of, of kinship and overlap for us too, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I want to thank you both uh, for this honest interview and for your very brave work and for agitating us into more <laughs> connection. My question was related to the first one, which is, do you write in Farsi ever? And if you do, do you come to different truths or a different mm. perspective? I don't, and I wish I could because I'm sure I would. <laughs> yeah. And I think that knowing that I'm missing that is one of the hardest losses, actually. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you both, uh, firstly. Uh, and then I have like a two-part question. Um, the, the first part is in relationship to uh, when you were talking about writing look and um, about uh, specifically how uh, in coming back to it, uh, and in writing the title poem, uh, you thought about what the argument of the book was. Um, I'm sort of wondering how you conceive of books as projects, um, and specifically how that language of the book as an argument, or um, I guess ultimately what the purpose of a book is for you uh, in your writing process. And then the other part of the question is sort of in relationship to this, you have a really like wonderful essay um, in the Volta called like the near transitive properties of the political and the poetical. And in that essay, you talk about uh, erasure uh, and specifically like how erasure is more, well, it's as of late been more predominant in American letters and in poetry. Um, and you talk about how um, it has this connection though to like military violence. So I just would like to hear more about that, specifically how you came to erasure in your project and how you negotiated that. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in terms of erasure, the, this formal tactic of, of like redacting poems or, or any kind of found text and then creating a new poem out of it, um, beca had become fashionable in a way that I found chilling because of the word itself, erasure, because of the action itself, which is necessarily violent, but it was being done to texts that have no, no obvious relationship to uh, violence, particularly state-sponsored violence. You know, I mean, this was, this was a tactic that was kind of proliferating alongside all these, uh, these WikiLeaks that we're, we're giving us all these documents of, of kind of state-sponsored redaction. Um, it just seemed to me that it would be 
uh, irresponsible of me as a writer to attempt erasure without acknowledging its relationship to actual erasure. And I think those are the projects of quote unquote erasure that I'm most drawn to. A book like Zong, for example, you know, where you are using the violence that is being committed against the language in the text to diagnose and enact a greater violence. Um, and it's an actual violence that is done against bodies and people. So I really, other than those imagined Guantanamo erasures um, and a few poems where it's, there's missing words, uh, it's not a tactic I really do. But even with the Guantanamo erasures, for example, I did not write an entire poem and then black it, black it out. Whatever is missing for the reader is missing for me. It felt to me like it would be some kind of trickery or some kind of cleverness to have a complete poem that I can access and that is being withheld from the reader. Now, this is something that is not acknowledged in the book. I don't know that any reader will necessarily know that reading the poems, but it's the kind of ethical consideration that I find very important in my own, in my own practice. In terms of book, uh, that's harder to answer. This, I saw that the DOD has its own dictionary, but it, I had to sit on it for about at least a year because I kept asking myself, what's the one poem that I'm going to write in response to this text? And it took me a long time to realize it wasn't a single poem, it was a whole book. My own brain um, thinks in, in larger, kind of um, more like symphonic <laughs> constructions. Um, it's very difficult for me to narrow down on one single thing. Um, and so it books to me and having like a book length question that one can keep wrestling with over and over and over just feels uh, like the kind of thinking that I want to be engaged in. One that, one that gives incredible consideration and time to, in my case, usually ethical concerns and considerations, but also um, through that immediate and, and short poetic burst. You know? So that tension of like the long, the huge, and the very small in particular and specific is one that I find really exciting as a book length thing. Yeah, does that answer? Yeah, sure. Maybe I will um, take the liberty of asking the last question okay. uh, as a segue from that or a closure point. Um, do you have a new project uh, that you're working on that you're willing to talk about? No. I do. No, I do. I do. I'm trying to figure out how to. Yes, I do. I, um, you know, the poems that I read tonight, uh, the last two poems are going into this new project. and. And my obsession remains with, you know, how, how, how does power impact and, and decide what we, what we say and how we say it. Um, but the gaze is a little different, and I am following uh, a single voice, I think, this time, um, and a single e alien in exile that is critiquing the metropole, so to speak. And uh, it's, the working title is Customs right now, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that, yeah. Well, I'm ready for it whenever yeah. you're done writing it. Would you all please join me in thanking Salmas one more time for this amazing <laughs> evening.